Hello people of the interweb. So if you are stumbling across my channel and my little corner of the internet for the first time, then welcome and I do hope you stick around. If you are returning, then welcome to episode two. And if you're new, then let me just break it down for you super quickly. This is Makeup and Mayhem, True Crime with Bella Monsoon. So at this point you may be asking yourself, okay, great, but what does that really mean? So my name is Latasha, I am the face behind Bella Monsoon. By profession, I'm actually a mental health care professional and so I've decided to combine my absolute love of makeup with my absolute fascination with true crime as well as the motives behind why people do what they do. So every single episode of Makeup and Mayhem will involve me completing a super easy to follow makeup tutorial whilst delving into a mind-blowing true crime story and looking at the potential psychological motives behind why they did what they did. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in, then please do remember to subscribe to the channel because there will be a new video every single week. Before I start the story, I just want to put a disclaimer out there because the story itself is incredibly graphic and the subject matter includes violence, substance abuse, cannibalism, sodomization, pedophilia, and child abuse. And it may not be suitable for sensitive viewers. I would also like to add that I mean absolutely no disrespect to the families of the victims who are mentioned in this video. The purpose of this video is simply to educate and to spread awareness on the heinous crimes that were committed. The story has also been thoroughly researched by myself and includes real life accounts of individuals who were involved directly in this case. So without further ado, let's get on to it. So this story begins with a baby boy whose real name was never known to this day. And he was born on November 11th, 1966 in Boxburg, South Africa. So he ended up only spending the first six months of his life with his biological family because at the age of six months old, his sister and himself, his sister was slightly older than him, I think she was a toddler at that point, were dumped in a telephone booth in Boxburg. So it would seem like all hope was not lost because a domestic worker found them and she decided to take them home to her employer. Little did she know that this would set up a tragic chain of events that no one could foretell. So this employer who was only ever known as Dup, he decided to keep the children and during the first two years of this young boy's life he was horrifically abused. And during this time his sister also disappeared and he only found out what happened to her 30 odd years later. So just a warning to all viewers that the next few statements are extremely graphic in nature and they do contain sexual assault, pedophilia and child abuse. If you would like to skip this I will put a timestamp on screen now where you can just fast forward to. All of these accounts were verified and confirmed by the neighbor who later adopted this young boy. So this young boy attested to a lot of abuse that was suffered at the hands of Dup. So this young boy was chained outside with the dogs many a time. He was forced to eat out of the dog bowls and he had his genitals burnt with a lighter. So Dup would then engage in acts of bestiality with his dogs and if that wasn't bad enough, once he was done, he would force this young boy to then clean his genitals with his mouth. So it was at this stage of time that this young boy was extremely malnourished, he was neglected, he was full of lice, and the neighbors saw him and they took pity on him and they took him in. His family was known as the Wilkins. They wanted to adopt this young boy, but they needed the consent of his biological mother. And this young boy actually remembers the day when this strange woman that he had never seen before came to the house she offered him sweets which he refused and then she left and he never saw her again turns out in later 
conversations, he found out that that was actually his mother. So when this woman disappeared, she also relinquished her parental rights, which allowed the Wilkins to adopt this young boy. And that is exactly what they did. And they named him Stuart. So I just want to take a quick minute to explain a psychological concept that might make understanding Stuart's later crimes a little bit easier. So Sigmund Freud was an extremely well-known and famous Austrian neurologist. He believed that our early years were divided into very specific stages and these were known as psychosexual stages. So how we navigated these specific stages kind of foretold how our behavior would be as adults. So depending on which phase of development a person has trauma in or experiences negative emotions in, that will determine what they end up fixating on in their later lives. So the first phase is from birth to one years old and that is known as the oral phase. During this phase if there's abandonment, abuse or neglect this will lead to an oral fixation later on in life. From a one to three years old is the anal phase and so negative experiences in this particular phase can lead to obsessive behavior, perfectionism and anal obsession later on in life. So I believe that these concepts could prove incredibly insightful in understanding Stuart and why he did what he did later on in his life. And I would like you to please keep these in mind as I share the story. So from the beginning of his time with the Wilkins, he was of course a really difficult child. And this was understandably so as he had been through so much of trauma and abuse in his very early on life. So he would bite people, he would hit people, and he struggled academically. So he ended up failing grade one. Mrs. Wilkins didn't really understand the depth of his trauma. And as a result of his failure, she just believed that he was being lazy. And so she she withheld his Christmas presents. So he was then sent to a special needs class where he ended up facing a lot of backlash from his peers, especially around the fact that he was adopted. Now this was significant because he didn't even know he was adopted up until this point and in his own account he says that the teacher encouraged this behavior and this bullying. So finding out that he was adopted further enraged him and he physically lashed out at his teacher for which he got sent to the principal and during this time corporal punishment was very common and no one really raised an eyebrow at it and so he was then beaten by his principal or punished by his principal. So at this stage Stuart really couldn't catch a break whether he was at home or at school. So the toll of all this childhood trauma it became more evident as Stuart grew up and he said that at the age of eight he began smoking marijuana. During this time he was also wetting the bed every single night and he was getting into a lot of trouble for it. So between the ages of eight and nine, his adoptive father passed away. This was incredibly significant as he had had a really close relationship with his adoptive father and that was the only positive male figure that he had had in his life and now he was gone. After his father's death, he then claims he was sodomized by a church deacon. This would have a massive, massive impact on his later crimes. So Mrs. Wilkins was alone after her husband passed and she found it increasingly more difficult to look after him and after reaching out to the welfare department she decided to send him to a reform school. So at this reform school Stuart actually claims that he suffered further torture, further sodomization and further abuse from the students and he tried to run away and did run away several times from the school. So the last time he ran away, he ran away to his adoptive aunt. He ended up staying with her for a month and then she gave him money to commute back to Port Elizabeth where Mrs. Wilkins had now moved. When he arrived in PE, he had to appear at the magistrate's court and a ruling was made that he would not have to go back to the reform school if he could finish grade 11, which is what he did. That is, however, the most education that he ever did receive. So he finished grade 11, he then went on to join the army. 
So after four months in the army, he was discharged after he attempted suicide and he was sent back home. Back home, he got a job, but shortly after that, he was injured. And so he started receiving a disability check. So in 1984, at the age of 18, he met Lynn and Lynn was to become his first wife. Lynn already had a daughter, but in December, a year later in 1985, she gave birth to Stuart's child, 1A. So the accounts of their family life at this stage differ slightly, as Lynn stated that after the birth of their child, he only wanted to engage in anal sex, whereas Stuart during this time says that after the birth of their child, Lynn became a sex worker and she would often leave himself with the kids at home while she was working the nights. Um, Whatever the case was, their family life was incredibly unstable and for this reason the welfare department came a knocking and they wanted to remove the oldest daughter from their house. So in a bid to stave off the welfare department, they ended up getting married and they got married in 1990. 1990 was an incredibly important year because this marked the year that Stuart admits to his first confessed murder. So his first murder occurred in 1990. This was the year that he married Lynn and he was also triggered by the welfare department attempting to take away the oldest daughter. So his first victim was a 15 year old boy who was a homeless child who was thought to have been propositioning for sex in order to get food. Stewart ended up sodomizing him and strangling him to death before he dumped his body in a school ground in Sydenham, Port Elizabeth. Later accounts, Stewart admits that at the exact moment that the life left this young boy's body, he remembers ejaculating. At this time, he was only 24 years old. And the murder of this young boy would only be solved seven years later. So fast forward to October 3rd in 1990, after an argument with his wife Lynn, he then went out and he met sex worker Virginia Heisman, who was 25 years old at the time. They agreed on 50 Rand for the transaction and Wilkin had vaginal sex with her. After this, he wanted to have anal sex with her, to which she refused. He became enraged and he ended up strangling her with her own clothing. This also marked the beginning of his strangulation fantasies. And he then dumped her body on the school grounds where she was later found. So three months later, it was January 1991, he met another sex worker by the name of Mercia Poppenfoss. He took her to St. George's Park and when she asked for payments up front, he became enraged and said, and I quote, sex is a natural act which should be freely available and that no woman or man should be allowed to charge for it or refuse it. Mm. Charming. Yeah, so there's so much I could say about this, but I will continue. So it's also at this stage I would like to just give another trigger warning because the next bit of information is extremely graphic so if you are squeamish I will put a timestamp on screen which you can just skip ahead to. So it was with this victim that he began what would be one of his most common acts fulfilling one of his biggest desires and that was necrophilia. So this occurred because he had strangled her before he had had sex with her and so he was not sexually satisfied. After she was dead he then proceeded to sleep with her dead body. So from the this point on he also began to hide the bodies better and he would also stuff rolled up newspaper into the orifices of his victims in order to prevent maggots and other worms from entering so that he could return to the bodies at a later stage to once again have sexual acts with them and to relive those murders. So much to unpack here but I'm just laid out there. It's also incredibly pertinent to mention here that he did this with his male victims and not really his female sex worker victims. On the 21st of October 1991, Stewart met a 14 year old street child boy. This boy, according to Stewart, agreed to have sex with him, so Stewart took him to St. George's Park. <sighs> 
However, when they got to St. George's Park, this boy demanded 50 Rand, which enraged Stuart, and he ended up sodomizing him and strangling him with his own clothing. Um, once again, Stuart admits that he climaxed whilst strangling this young boy. In this way, you can see how Stuart's sexual fantasies were fulfilled not only by having sex with his victims but by actually strangling his victims to death. So the body of this young boy was actually only discovered two years later in 1993 which allowed Stuart much time to revisit the body time and time again. And in 1993, Stuart met yet another young 14-year-old boy. So this young boy masturbated him and then Stuart tried to sodomize him to which he cried out and threatened to tell the police. This angered Stuart and he then strangled him and left his body outside the Fort Frederick Museum. So all the while this was happening, Lynn was still married to Stuart but their relationship was deteriorating by the day and she would often call the police on him for his marijuana use. He was then eventually admitted to the Elizabeth Duncan Psychiatric Hospital and apparently diagnosed with psychopathy. His stay in the psychiatric hospital was quite short and he was discharged without a treatment plan or any form of help going forward. So during this time he was seen by many healthcare professionals but no one could really tell the horrors that lay just beyond the surface of this man and all the atrocious acts that he had committed which just goes to show you how good he became at pretending and hiding the truth. So just on a side note, psychopathy and personality disorders don't have medications that can actually be taken. However, there are treatment plans and coping strategies that can be put into place to improve the quality of life for the person. After being discharged from the hospital, Stuart returned home. His wife Lynn was not impressed by this and she called the police. When he saw the police coming, he tried to overdose with a bunch of pills and shortly after this, Lynn decided to divorce him. After this divorce, she kept Wane, their daughter, in her home. So Lynn decided to get remarried and during this time Wene was still living with her so when Stuart came to visit his daughter he would be out on the pavement outside the home because he always got into altercations and arguments with the new husband. So after the murder in 1993 there seems to be a hiatus where there was just no murders and so this begs the question and I was wondering if there were perhaps murders during this time which the bodies have not been found and he has not admitted to or was he just genuinely preoccupied with starting his new life so during this time he became a fisherman and developed a love for the ocean and he also met and married a colored woman by the name of veronica who had two sons already from a previous relationship says he would only get into relationships or sleep with women who were not white. Essentially, he was terrified of accidentally sleeping with his sister and committing a crime, the crime of incest. So this is something that is actually quite prevalent with serial killers, that although they do the most heinous of crimes, they always seem to have their own rule book, their own codes that they will not go against. And for Stuart, incest was one of his. So her family did not like him, not one bit. Good on them. They could see something that everyone else couldn't. And this made their relationship incredibly difficult. And it was during this time that Stuart began killing again. Once again, I know this is getting old, but I feel that it is pertinent because certain parts of this narrative are extremely disturbing. And I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, even if you are into true crime. So I would just like to add a disclaimer here that there is graphic, violent content 
event coming up in the next statement. Once again, I will add a timestamp on screen if you just want to skip ahead. On the 27th of July 1995, Stewart agreed to pay 42-year-old sex worker Georgina Swene 30 rand to have sex. He then took her to the park, but instead, once he was there, he sodomized her and strangled her to death. After raping and killing her, he still felt an arousal, however, he could not maintain an erection. So he then took a knife and he inserted it into her vagina and he cut her from the inside. There were over 20 cut wounds and stab wounds on her lower abdomen and genitals. And if that was not bad enough, he then sliced off her nipples and he consumed them. And this became his first case of cannibalism during a murder. The usage of the knife became symbolic for him in aiding that release that he desired. During this time, he became hyper aware of the investigations that were going on around the bodies that had been found. Because he didn't have one particular victim type and he was murdering both young boys and sex workers, the murders weren't linked to one another and thus no one was on the lookout for him per se. So during this time though, he became hyper aware of what was going on. So he adjusted his modus operandi to remove the clothing of his victims so as not to leave evidence behind. A police officer on the case later remarked that although Stuart Wilkins did not have a high IQ, he was very capable of learning whatever he wanted to, and in this case, it was how to become an untraceable killing machine. So, two months after killing Georgina, Stuart Wilkins created what was notably the most heinous of all the crimes he committed, simply because of who he did it to. At this point in time, he was still living with Veronica, but every now and then he would choose to go and live in a field outside of Happy Valley in Port Elizabeth. The place that Stuart had visited as a child and he had really happy memories there. The field itself also had a view of the ocean, which of course, as you know from earlier recounts, Stuart loved. So on the 29th of September 1995, Stuart went to visit his daughter, Wane, who was 10 years old at the time. He later relayed that he had taken her to his makeshift home in the field behind Happy Valley. So when he was speaking to her, she had apparently told him how her stepfather, Lynn's new husband, was molesting her and how they were being neglected at home in terms of not having enough food to eat. It was at this stage that Stuart allegedly conducted an examination on her to see whether she was a virgin or not. When he had figured out that she was indeed not a virgin anymore, he decided that he was going to send her to heaven so that she could avoid having the type of life that he had had. He strangled his own daughter and kept her body. He then started sleeping next to her body until she had decomposed so badly that there was just a skeleton left behind. He then put the bones aside and he bundled up her clothing to resemble a person and then he slept next to that. To this day, he denies raping his daughter and because of the state of the body when it was found, there was no way of knowing whether or not this was true. He was questioned after her disappearance. However, he told police that he left her on the steps of their house. He then went dormant until about eight months later. On the 25th of May, 1996, he met sex worker Katrina Klaassen. He took her down to the beach where he then proceeded to rape her, strangle her, and stuff a plastic bag down her throat. He then dumped her body by a wall which had graffiti on it which read people shouldn't steal. He thought this was incredibly ironic and funny because he believed, like I had mentioned earlier, that sex workers should not charge and that they were stealing from people when they charged for sex. 
So from a psychological point of view, one reason why he could have been targeting female sex workers is that to him, females represented abandonment and angst and anger, which is what he felt with his mother when she left him and his ex-wives. He also recounted that each time he would strangle his victim, he liked to be facing them full on so that he could watch their eyes bulge, he could watch their lips turn blue, and it was this very act that helped him to reach climax. Then between May and August of 1996, he met another street child who he sodomized and strangled and dumped on the grounds where he dumped his first victim. Another potential reason why he could have chosen his young male victims is that he was reenacting his childhood trauma. However, he was now in a position of power. And so he was able to relive that trauma from a different point of view. He also believed that the children should not have to suffer like he did, which is ironic because he was first making them suffer and then putting them out of their misery so they didn't have to suffer. So in 1996, the body of his daughter, Wane, was discovered, but it would only be until 1997 when the identity of her remains would become known. So in early 1997, his current wife, Veronica, took her two sons to the police station because they had complained to her about Stuart and ultimately cases of sodomy were laid against him. In response to these charges, Stuart fled and he began to live full time in the felt behind Happy Valley. So during this time, he went into town daily and he became very well known by the locals because he would wear the same dirty shirt, jeans and wellingtons. And so this is also where his name came about, which is Buti Bur. And that roughly translated from Afrikaans means brother farmer. So on the 22nd of January 1997, 12-year-old Henry Baker was walking home from his grandmother's house. Henry actually knew Stuart because Stuart had spent a few nights at their family home. Stuart began to talk to Henry and lead him away to his makeshift home on the felt. However, a friend of this young boy saw Stuart leading the young boy away to the felt and not down the road where he lived and he recognized this man as Buti Bur because everyone knew him in the area like I mentioned. So this young boy ran after them and he asked Stuart where they were going to which Stuart replied that he should mind his own business. The child was a bit taken aback, but watched as this young boy, Henry, walked with Stuart down to the felt. And that was the last time this young boy was ever seen. However, Stuart has a different narrative. And in his narrative, he says that Henry wanted to be taught about sex and willingly went with him to the makeshift home in the felt. Stuart says that once they arrived there, that he had masturbated the boy and forced Henry to perform oral sex on him. And then when he was sodomizing him, Henry had screamed, so he had strangled him. So after this boy was reported missing, the child protection unit, who were also investigating the disappearance of 1A, they started investigating this case too. So it was at this point that the young boy who had seen them, he came forward and he told the investigating officer what he had seen. So on the 28th of January, 1997, Stewart was arrested in relation to the disappearance of this young boy. He was later released as he provided an alibi However, upon checking that the alibi was indeed false, he had said he had been with a woman, which they thought could have been true at the time. But once they discovered that that alibi was false, he was rearrested on the 31st of January, 1997. So it was Sergeant Detective Norsworthy who was in charge of the interview of Stuart Wilkins. And ultimately it was him who managed to get the confession out of Stuart and the first three words that Stuart uttered in relation to all the cases was 
I am sick. So he then went on to admitting to killing his daughter, Wane, and he also admitted to killing Henry and also mentioned that he had been back to the body just that morning to commit necrophilia. He ended up showing them where the bodies of the children were and he then admitted to another 10 crimes. Police then worked backwards using the dockets of information they had and matching that to the information that Stewart provided. At the end of the day, they could only find evidence for eight of those murders. So along with the murder of Henry and Wane, Stewart was only accused and charged for 10 murders. So the psychological and forensic crime expert that was brought in for the case, Dr. Mickey Pistorius, noted that his presenting disposition was incredibly gentle and quiet, which stood in stark contrast to the man who had committed these heinous crimes. He also noted a extremely high sexual connection to the crimes that he had committed, with him even excusing himself during the interview so that he could masturbate in the bathroom. She believes that Stuart would have not had the ability to stop himself from raping his daughter and she also strongly believes that Stuart has no hope of rehabilitation. Throughout the trial, Stuart was incredibly calm and unperturbed as evidence was being given against him. The only point in which he appeared visibly shaken was when his daughter Wane's skull was brought into the courtroom as evidence. It was at this stage that he asked the court for an adjournment. Following that, he went to the bathrooms in the courthouse and he proceeded to masturbate himself to release the sexual urges he felt after seeing his daughter's skull. I'm just going to give you a moment. Let that sink in. Just sit with that. So on the 23rd of February 1998, he was found guilty and sentenced to seven life sentences. He was only 31 years old at the time of sentencing. Upon hearing his fate, he actually displayed emotion and he burst into tears. The judge on the case made the remarks that whilst he understood the traumatic background that Stuart had had growing up, he didn't necessarily believe that absolutely every single person that had come into Stuart's life had abused him. He also remarked that if the death penalty or death sentence was still available, he would have also received that. Stuart requested to serve his time in a place that had mental health and psychiatric facilities because in his own words, if one day, if I'm ever allowed free, I can also live life as a normal person. Look, I've tried to stay impartial throughout the story, but I'm just gonna add my two cents worth here and say, for the love of all good things in this world, I hope and pray that he never, ever gets released. So during this time, Sergeant Nasworthy actually managed to contact his biological mother and he organized a phone call between Stuart and his biological mother where he listened in just to see if there was any other information he could have maybe received during this conversation. So during this conversation, Stuart became incredibly childlike again once he heard it was his mother and he even called her mommy, a word which he had never used once in his entire life. She then explained to him that her boyfriend of the time, his father, had forced her to give the children up because she was pregnant again. So she was forced to abandon them. However, she had come back and picked up his sister and his sister was alive and well. So in a way, this was closure for him, but this was also a reminder that she came back and fetched his sister, but not him. So. After that horrific tale, you may be asking yourself, where in the world is Stuart now? Well, I have the answer for you, of course. 
Stuart is currently serving out his sentence in St. Albans Prison in Port Elizabeth. He says he currently suffers from nightmares and that the ghosts of the victims he has killed haunt him. So as we reach the end of this episode, I kind of have a question for you, the viewer. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Do you think this is a case of nature versus nurture? Do you think that Stuart was born a monster and he inherently had all this inside of him that was just brought out throughout the years? Or do you believe that he is just a product of his environment and that at the end of the day it was society and all the abuse and trauma that he experienced in his childhood that created the monster? So yeah, I will leave that for you guys to answer in the comment section below. I would love to hear your thoughts. And with that, I conclude episode two of Makeup and Mayhem, True Crime with Bella Monsoon. I really hope that you learned something this episode. I know it wasn't something that I can say, oh, I hope you guys enjoyed the episode because there really wasn't anything to enjoy about hearing these stories. But I hope that I managed to spread some awareness and perhaps teach you and educate you about something that you may have not known. Until next week, stay safe, stay awesome, and stay blessed. Bye!